Well, again, good morning. We are in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6. We'll be reading verses 12 through 31 and then look at it in detail. Luke, chapter 6, beginning in verse 12, Lord willing, all the way through till verse 31. So, here we go. Luke, chapter 6, beginning in verse 12. Now, it came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called his disciples to himself, and from them he chose twelve, whom he also named apostles, Simon, whom he also named Peter, and Andrew his brother, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon called the Zealot, Judas the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who also became a traitor. And he came down with them and stood on a level place with a crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem, from the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon, who came to hear him and be healed of their diseases, as well as those who were tormented with unclean spirits. And they were healed. And the whole multitude sought to touch him, for power went out from him and healed them all. Then he lifted up his eyes toward his disciples and said, Blessed are you, poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you, and when they exclude you, and revile you, and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice in that day, and leap for joy. For indeed your reward is great in heaven, for in like manner their fathers did to the prophets." But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full, for you shall hunger. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who spitefully use you. To him who strikes you on the one cheek, offer the other also. And from him who takes away your your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who asks of you. And from him who takes away your goods, do not ask them back. And just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise. And that last verse there, that is known as the golden rule. The golden rule does not mean he who has the gold makes the rules. (laughs) The golden rule is do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Or how you want people to treat you, that's how you treat others. Now, to catch us up to speed, Jesus had just dealt with the religious rulers whose traditions violated the very spirit and intent of God's law. They were critical of the disciples who simply fixed themselves something to eat on the Sabbath day. And they were downright cruel to the man with a withered right hand, using him as a pawn in their attempt to find fault with Jesus because according to their traditions, healing on the Sabbath day was considered a work. And so they set Jesus up, brought this man in there in the synagogue, hoping on the Sabbath day that Jesus would heal him so that they might have reason to accuse him of wrongdoing. How cruel they were. Jesus rebuked them and in essence said, it would be evil to not heal this man on the Sabbath. And then he pulled the ultimate because I said so. Jesus said, because I am the Lord of the Sabbath. So you want to know about Sabbath rules? It all begins and ends with me. That's what Jesus was saying. And so Jesus healed him. Well, the religious rulers were so corrupted by their traditions that they began plotting how they might destroy him. Now, in verses 12 through 16, on the very heels of that, we read that Jesus chose them. Jesus chose them. Aren't you amazed at the choices that God makes? The people that God chooses? Just look at the person in the mirror. You will be amazed at whom God chooses. Verse 12. Now, it came to pass in those days, kind of around the time when Jesus healed the man with the withered hand, that he, Jesus, went out to the mountain to pray. Jesus often withdrew by himself to pray. And he continued all night, all night in prayer to God. This was a special night of prayer because Jesus was getting ready to appoint 12 men to be his disciples. 
A decision that he did not make lightly. Now, it is true that we should pray about every, every little thing. Every little thing we should pray about and ask God's will, Lord, is this your will or, or that your will? To buy this candy bar or that candy Well, maybe not that extreme, but... Or to buy them both, God, yes. No, uh, but we should pray about every little detail. But we should especially pray long and hard about the big things, especially those who we may want to co-labor with. For Jesus here isn't just picking out 12 guys to hang out with, with him. Through these 12 men, Jesus would give birth to the Christian church, the very bride of Christ. And so this was a decision that he needed to pray about long and hard. And when we consider who Jesus did call, it's no wonder that he prayed long and hard. And he kept praying after the choice, long and hard. Verse 13, when it was day, he called his disciples to himself. And from them he chose twelve whom he also named apostle. Disciple means one who learns. And there were many, many disciples, those who were coming to Jesus at this particular time, hundreds, hundreds of them that considered themselves to be one of his disciples, one who learned. But from them, he chose 12 specific men whom he renamed apostles. They graduated from D, disciples to A, apostles. No, okay. Thank you. I'm glad you're back visiting. The word apostle, apostle means one who is sent out. See, a disciple is one who learns, but eventually God wants us to grow up to where we are then sent out to serve him, to represent him. The apostles were sent out in the power of the Holy Spirit to represent the light of the world, Jesus Christ, to a dark world. And so God wants us to learn, to be disciples, and really for our whole entire lives. But there's a point in time when we must mature, grow up in our faith, and see ourselves more than just one who is learning, but one who is sent out to represent the King of Kings in this world. Verse 14 begins to name these distinguished gentlemen whom Jesus called to be his apostles. Simon, verse 14, whom he also named Peter, and Andrew, his brother. James and John. James and John were also brothers. Not of Simon and and Andrew, but also these other set of brothers. And then Philip and Bartholomew. Don't know if they were brothers or not, but they are mentioned together. Matthew, the tax collector. Thomas, the one who later on doubted. James, the son of Alphaeus. Have no idea who he is. Simon called the zealot. A really excitable sort of guy. Judas, the son of James, but not to be confused with Judas Iscariot, who also became a traitor. Now, there's some of these guys we don't hardly know anything about except some church history books. But what we do know is that Jesus' choice of these men is confusing, very unusual. You have one who wavered and one deny him, two hotheads, one doubter, one Roman sympathizer, one anti-government radical, a dreamer, and others of somewhat little significance. There was only one who really seemed qualified, and it was one who came from a well-to-do family in the important southern Judean town of Kirioth. Therefore, he was known as Judas Iscariot of the town of Kirioth. He was the only one who seemed to be qualified. Hmm, interesting, huh? Jesus chooses unlikely people who normally would have, these guys, example, normally would have been at odds with each other. You have a zealot who hated the Roman government, and then you had Matthew, a tax collector, a sympathizer of the Roman government, two polar opposites, but yet one in Jesus Christ. I mean, look around this room. I said, Look around at this room. Yeah, look around. I mean, there's a lot, not up, but around, you know. So I'm like a little floor. Oh, there's an interesting floor. No, you don't get it, do you? If we look around this very room, we see people from various different backgrounds. Some of you came from, you know, you were jocks as a kid, and some of you were stoners as a kid, you know. Or as we called them when I was a kid, dopers, you know, because I was a jock. So... (laughs) People, those groups hated each other, yet you, these people get saved, the stoners repent, the jocks, they repent of their arrogance, supposed to at least. 
And then they come together and they're one in Jesus Christ and have great fellowship. Different cultures coming together in Jesus Christ. Becoming one in Him. And that's what Jesus does. He chooses unlikely people, puts them all together, and says, now love each other. And lo and behold, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we're able to do so. And I believe that what we see here at Calvary Chapel Bartlett is just a mere beginning of such a beautiful, unintended thing. Unintended in that I certainly don't see myself as one who's called by God to unite the races, to fix the race problem in Memphis. No, no, no. We came out to teach the Bible. The end. I knew as a result of that, that God would bring people together that have different backgrounds, different cultures, different ways of looking at things, and God would make us all one in Jesus Christ. And that's what we see here, and I couldn't be more thrilled. But it's just the beginning. Hang in there, gang. God's going to do an amazing work. I really believe the Lord wants to do an amazing work through this little fellowship. And if we will remain flexible, if we will be yielded, if we will allow the Lord to do things that are outside of our box, outside of what we think should be, and we're going to see some amazing things. But even now, I look around this room And I see us very much like the 12 apostles, different guys, different gals from different places, all brought together, one in Jesus Christ. So God's choices are are very unlikely, very unusual. And all I need to do is look at the man in the mirror and agree with that. Yep, I don't know what you were thinking, God, but I'm glad you chose me. And aren't you glad he chose you also? Verses 17 through 19, Jesus heals whoever is hungry for him. Whoever's hungry for him, Jesus heals. Notice verse 17. He came down with them and stood on a level place with a crowd of his disciples and great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem, that's in the south, and from the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon, that's up in the northwest. So from all over, it came to hear him and be healed of their diseases, as well as those who were tormented with unclean spirits. Demon-possessed people were delivered. And they were healed. And the whole multitude sought to touch him, for power went out from him and healed them all. What does that remind us of? People touching him and being healed. What does that remind us of? The woman who had the flow of blood for 12 years. And she said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I know I'll be made whole. And she did so. Man, what a powerful testimony she had. Has God done something amazing for you? Tell others. Because what may happen is they will then see Jesus as help for them. And they will come to him for what they need. Just like the woman who touched the hem of his garment and then news went out. Oh, really? You can do that? That happens? Just, okay. And so everybody crowding, I want to be healed. And they were touching him as well. And power went forth to heal them. Here Jesus is exercising his lordship over sickness. Also over demons, over sin, over death, over hell itself, because Jesus is the Lord of all. Over the law, over disease, the devil, sin, sickness, over eternity. Jesus is Lord of all. The question, though, this morning is, is he your Lord? Is he really your Lord? Have you, rec- have you confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord? Do you really believe in your heart God raised him from the dead? The Bible says, if so then you're saved. But if he's not your Lord, you're not yet saved. Why don't you make him your Lord this morning? Why are you holding out? What do you got that's so good, so wonderful, that you think, oh, if I gave my life to Jesus, I'd have to give that thing up? You know? What is it that you have that you think so wonderful that's keeping you from him? From heaven? From having all of your sins free. For knowing love like you've never known it before. Peace like you've never had before. And hope that sure. We heard about hope and change. How's that working out for us? You know, we hear about so... And by the way, we're getting ready for another political season. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Jesus, come back quickly. I can't stand any of this stuff anymore. If you're looking to men to rescue us, you're looking in the wrong place. Come to Jesus. What do you have that's so great that's keeping you from knowing Him? I've looked around. I've tried many things. 
There's nothing that comes close to having a relationship with Jesus. Nothing worth it. There's nothing in life that's worth holding on to at the expense of losing my soul. Losing eternity. Come to Jesus today. If you don't know how, come forward after the closing song. We'll just lead you in a simple prayer of asking Jesus to be the Lord of your life. It's very easy. Because Jesus did the difficult part. He paid for your sins in full on the cross. He rose from the dead on the third day, proving that he is the Son of God and the only way to heaven. He did the hard part. Now you and I, we do the easy part. Just ask him to be the Lord of your life. So he is the Lord, but is he your your Lord? In verses 20 through 49, we read about the sermon on a level place. Hmm. Anybody heard about the Sermon on the Mount? This is the Sermon on a level place. Notice in verse 17, he came down with them and stood on a level place. There it is. So he's on a level place and a crowd of his disciples. That was verse 17. We're moving on here. Verses 20 through 29, the sermon on a level place. Here Luke is recording a sermon of Jesus that is similar to the sermon on the mount that's found in Matthew's gospel. But there are differences. For example, in Matthew's gospel, Jesus is sitting on a hillside speaking to the disciples. But here in Luke, in verse 17, again, it says that he stood on a level place and preached this sermon. Both sermons have similarities, but there are many, many differences between the two as well. In Luke's sermon on a level place, Jesus here contrasts the blessed life with the cursed life. The blessed life is that which the world looks down upon. If you're going to do what Jesus says and be blessed by him, the world says, well, you're wasting your time. The cursed life, however, is the life that the world madly pursues. They say, well, this is really important. You ought to be pursuing those things. And Jesus says, if you pursue those things, you're going to be cursed. Also, Jesus states that the blessed life is that which is invested in eternal things, whereas the cursed life is about trying to get all that you can here and now on this side of eternity. Jesus began both the Sermon on the Mount and the Sermon on the Level Place with what are called Beatitudes, or as some have suggested, statements that reflect what our attitudes ought to be. Be Beatitudes. The Beatitudes begin with the word blessed or blessed. Now, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount and his Sermon on a Level Place were not meant as blanket blessing statements for all of humanity. Who specifically did Jesus direct his comments toward? Who specifically? His disciples. He directed his comments not toward the world, because, gang, there's, there's no blessings for those that are still in the world. There's only judgment. But if you're a believer in Jesus, then these words of blessing absolutely apply to you. And the implication of these blesseds, by the way, as you'll see, is if you're doing the right thing, but it doesn't seem to be working out well for you, still you are blessed. In fact, be glad. Because though you didn't get your due on this side of eternity, God will more than compensate you on the other side. Verse 20, let's look at this. He lifted up his eyes toward his disciples and said, Blessed are you poor. Now, Matthew's gospel, he said poor in spirit, but here specifically he meant disciples who did not have cash, who did not have much in this world. Blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Now, you read that and you think, oh, that doesn't make sense. There's a wealthy man who said, once I was poor, now I am rich. Trust me, rich is better. And that seems to be the the logical, logical thing. Now, how, according to Jesus, if you're a disciple, that it is a blessing to be poor? How is it a blessing for a Christian to be poor? You know, if this life is all that there is, here today, gone tomorrow, then we should try to get all we can. You remember that bumper sticker years ago, he who dies with the most toys wins? If this life only is what we have, then man, 
You lay up all the treasures on earth you can amass. But if this life is merely just a beginning and eternity awaits, then what matters are not riches here and now, but there and then. As Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21, I encourage you to write down these words, look, or these verses, look them up later on, meditate on, pray over them. Let the Lord minister to your heart. Let me read this to you. Jesus himself said, Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And if your heart is in your stuff, if or when your 1977 Dodge Ram van, tradesman van, with a 318 engine in it, is stolen from your driveway after you've worked long and hard on it, redoing the interior, replacing the motor mounts, fixing the transmission. Just saying, for example, if your heart is in that thing, when it drives off down the road under its own power seemingly... You're going to be distraught. You're going to lose it. But if you lay up treasures in heaven, there's nobody to break in and steal. There's no decay. There's no rot. There's no rust. It's forever for you. So you tell me, where should we be emphasized? What what kingdom should we be investing in? The earthly ones? Our own? Or in God's? So if you're a believer, Jesus says, and you're struggling financially... But you're serving God and you're trying to minister to others. Jesus promises you're going to be blessed. Oh, when heaven arrives, when you get there, oh, because you did not get your due on this side, you're going to be more than compensated on the other side. In other words, your inheritance is going to be out of this world. So blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Next part of verse 21. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be filled. Hunger is a byproduct of being poor. Jesus promises, though, that believers that are forced to be hungry on this side of eternity can trust that one day they will be filled at the wedding feast of the Lamb. If you went hungry here, you're going to have too much in heaven. The abundance that will be there. Blessed are you, verse 21, uh, the next part, blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. You know, we as believers do have times of weeping, don't we? We're not immune from suffering. Jesus even promised that in this world we would have tribulations. Jobs are lost. Family members die. Children become teenagers. I mean, there's a lot of sorrow and hurt in this world. But Jesus promises that he will return our weeping today into rejoicing tomorrow. I know some of you teenagers shaking your hands. That's just wrong. (laughs) Oh, yeah, ask your parents. So weeping today, Jesus promises, will be rejoicing tomorrow. In Psalm 30, verses 11 and 12, you have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have put off my sackcloth, clothed me with gladness. To the end, the result will be that my glory may sing praise to you and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. So weeping today, rejoicing tomorrow. In Revelation chapter 21, verse 4, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain. Oh, yeah. For the former things have passed away. Try to get that deal on this side of eternity from anyone. Not going to happen. Politicians will promise it. Only Jesus delivers it. Verse 22. Again, another paradoxical statement. Things that just don't make sense, but yet are definitely true. Blessed are you when men hate you. And when they exclude, they don't call you to invite you to their parties. And revile you. And cast out your name as evil. Oh, what a John. For this, but he says, notice, for the Son of Man's sake. 
So if people are upset and angry at you because you're standing up for Jesus, you're blessed. But if people are mad and upset because you're strange or obnoxious, well, there's no blessing in that. No blessing at all. But if you love the Lord and you're witnessing to others, and people dislike you, angry at your message, consider yourself blessed. Don't be bummed out. Instead, verse 23, rejoice in that day. Leap for joy. In other words, yippee, hooray. I've stood up for Jesus and now people hate me. Wait, why why am I happy about this? Verse 23, the next part, for indeed your reward is great in heaven. For in like manner their fathers did to the prophets. So persecution now results in reward in heaven by and by. Persecution now also resorts, or, or results in high heavenly esteem. Being named with the prophets, as Jesus there said, for in like manner their fathers did the prophets. You will be named among the prophets like Abraham, Samuel, Elijah, Elisha, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and the minor ones. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Boy, I practiced that over and over and over again to get it right, please. Okay, yeah. (laughs) Whatever. Standing up for Jesus, especially in our day, notice, will evoke negative responses. You stand up for Jesus... In this world, in this day, you may even be hated. But if you really trust in him, and your home and your hope is in heaven, then today's persecution is totally going to be worth it. Not just great will your reward be in heaven, not just you will be named with the prophets, but many other things the Bible talks about. A crown of life white robes, standing before the throne of God, following the Lamb wherever He goes. Jesus will wipe away every tear and on and on and on and on. Oh, the blessings for standing up for Jesus, even if it means persecution today. Best of all, should we be persecuted today? We're going to hear Jesus. We're going to see Him and hear Him. Look right at us and He'll say, well done. I mean, that's, that's worth the price of admission right there. To hear Jesus look at me and say to me, well done. My fear is he'll point to the flames of hell and order me to be well done. But no, he's going he's gonna to invite me in and say, well done. Good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. So we had four blesseds, but then they're followed by four woes. Four woes. Now the implication of these woes is this. If we're doing something wrong, But it seems that things are working out for the good anyway. Don't assume that God is overlooking the wrong or is even approving of the wrong. That's a huge mistake. Know for certain accounting day is coming. Each one of us will stand before the Lord and give an account to him of the words and the actions and even the thoughts. Now, thank God the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. But woe unto the person who knowingly is doing wrong, but yet excuses the wrongdoing because things seem to be working out for them anyway. No. We may get away with things on this side, but not on the other. No way. Verse 24, But woe to you who are rich. Again, the implication is those who have gained by unscrupulous manners by not being honest and hardworking. Woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. So if somebody hoards their riches, hasn't invested in God's kingdom, nor has ministered to those in need, their heavenly bank account is going to show a zero balance. Say it with me. Whoa. Whoa. Now those of you who didn't get in on that woe, well, you got three others to catch up with here in just a second. Verse 25, woe to you who are full, for you shall be hungry. So if a person lives high on the hog, a Christian, he's, he's, he or she's doing really well, but they haven't shared with others in need. Their plate at the wedding feast is going to be awfully empty. 
Say it with me. Woe. Woe. Verse 25, the second part, Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Again, the context, the implication is one who laughs off the needs of others with a, hey, that's not my problem sort of attitude. One who turns a blind eye to suffering never takes the needs of others seriously. Once Jesus reveals to them all of those heartless moments, boy, are they going to mourn and weep. Again, say it with me. Woe. Woe to you, verse 26, when all men speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. We live in a day where the world would say the most important thing in life are people's feelings. That the world wants us to not just tolerate people who are doing wrong, but to even celebrate and dance with them and march in their parades and be prideful with them. And oh, God forbid should you tell somebody that they're wrong. God forbid should we show them the Bible which says, oh, you don't want to hurt people's feelings. Now, I, 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 I know we're supposed to speak the truth in love. But we're supposed to speak the truth. Always. And sometimes the truth even in love Hurts people's feelings. Well, this worldly concept of, of you know, be, be not just tolerant, but celebrate everybody. Don't hurt people's feelings. This has even crept into the church today. And there are many people who will refuse to say anything out of fear they might hurt somebody's feelings. And there are pastors and preachers, ministers, who will only... Only teach the scriptures that have a positive, feel-good message. They'll never have the congregation say, whoa. No, no. And, and you, you hear about the seeker-sensitive, feel-good messages and all that. And people, wow, I feel really uplifted and positive. Is that really the goal? But there are many other scriptures that they avoid. They won't even touch with a 10-foot pole. Because there are scriptures that reveal that sin is going to be judged. And unless we bring our sin to Jesus and have his death and resurrection be payment for our sins in full, if we don't do that, we're going to hell. That's a message that you, you hardly hear anymore. False prophets abound today, telling people what they want to hear, not what they need to hear. I talked with a young man who was at a so-called Bible college and they have chapel every day. And he said at all the chapels that he's been to these last couple of semesters, not once has he remembered anybody saying the name of Jesus. Oh, they refer to God in very esoteric, generic terms. But see, there are many who believe that just the name of Jesus is divisive. Yes, it is. Because Jesus says, you're with me or you're against me. If you don't gather with me, you're scattering abroad. He is divisive. But the truth in love is that Jesus will receive you if you come to Him, if you believe in Him, and you'll have everlasting life. That's love. But the truth is, reject Him, and you'll pay for your sins forever. People who go through life and they never say anything controversial and they may be the toast of the town. Everybody likes them because, oh, they ever never have a mean thing to say. Jesus says, woe to them. Woe to them when all men speak well of you because that's how they spoke of the false prophets. The false prophets told people what they wanted to hear. Again, say it with me, guys. Woe. Jesus tells us to speak the whole truth. In love, of course, but the whole truth. And if someone gets angry at us for doing so, Jesus says that we're blessed. Isn't that amazing? Speak the whole truth in love. And if people get mad, hey, count yourself as blessed. Well, okay, great. I'll get to heaven. I'll be blessed. But Lord, how do I handle people today 
who are angry at me. That's a dilemma. Great, I'm going to be blessed by and by, but right now I'm not being blessed, I'm being blasted. How do I handle them, Lord? Well, Jesus explains that to us in verses 27 through 31, where he says, you do what you'd want done to you. You do what you'd want done to you. But I say to you, verse 27, say to you who hear, love your enemies. Eh, Really? Do I have to? Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who spitefully use you. To him who strikes you on the one cheek, offer the other also. And by the way, this is not saying if somebody wants to beat the stuffing out of you, let him do it. No, he's speaking of the insult, the, the slap, oh, you dirty dog, and slaps you across the face, and, and that's all it is. At that point, Jesus is saying, now don't beat him up, but take the offense, even offer him the other cheek. Now, if, if the person does want to beat the stuffing out of you, then you do have the right to defend yourself. But at this point, if it's just an offense, let the offense come, and let more come. And from him who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Hmm. Someone wants to take my stuff, let him take more than what they're even taking? Give to everyone who asks of you. And from him who takes away your goods, do not ask them back. Wow. Somebody wants to borrow my ladder and they have it in their garage three years later? That's okay? I should be okay with that? Now, all of this goes against the grain, doesn't it? We read these words like, oh, that's really, what does the Lord mean? He can't mean that. Actually, he does. He means exactly that. Love my enemies. Do good to those who hate me. If someone slaps my one cheek, offer them the other. Someone takes my stuff, I'm to give them more. And let it go without expecting it ever to return. Weird, huh? See, the natural response is eye for an eye. Or, as I like to think, if you take one of my eyes, I'm taking two of yours. Two eyes for my one eye. That's the natural response. The supernatural response is to respond to evil with kindness. And that's Jesus' point entirely. See, these are things we cannot do on our own. No way can I in my flesh return good for evil. But as a believer in Jesus Christ, you and I, we've been born again to become adopted children of God. We have taken on his very nature. The Holy Spirit is dwelling within us. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can respond to evil with the kindness of Christ. And by the way, as believers, we don't just react with the kindness of Christ, we even become proactive. We take the initiative. Notice in verse 31, as you want men to do to you. I wish others would bless me. Okay? That's great. You go bless them first. As you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise. Again, this is the golden rule. Do to others as you would have have them do to you. By the way, Jesus did not say respond to others as they've done to you. But he's saying you treat others first as you would want them to treat you. It's not reactive. It is proactive. We act first, thereby setting the tone for how we are to be treated. For example, somebody was was treating me proactively. They texted me, Pastor John, have a really nice day. Praying for you. Wow. They golden ruled me. And so in response, they got the right response. I text, well, thank you, and God bless you, and may your day be really blessed. See, they golden ruled me, and then I treated them how they treated me. And that's how it is to be. And not just to nice people, by the way. Jesus said, do this to your enemies. You golden rule your enemies. And you may find an interesting thing might take place. They may soften. 
they may turn their anger away. They might respond to the love of Jesus that you're showing them and be humbled and start actually being nice to you. Someone once said the best way to get rid of an enemy is to make him your friend. That's the golden rule right there. Make your enemy your friend. You treat them. You proactive. You golden rule them. And maybe they'll respond in a gracious manner. But maybe they won't. Maybe they'll just still be angry at you. Still be mad. You do all the nicest things in the world for them and they may still hate you. But at that point, what do we do? It's out of our hands. We've done all that we can do. And at that point, their response is between them and the Lord. But Jesus is telling us, don't wait for them to change and be nice. You be nice first. You do your part. You be proactive. You golden rule people as you would want to be treated. And by so doing, you will actually be like Jesus. For isn't that how he treated us? We love him. Why? Because he first loved us. He golden ruled us. He treated us as he would want us to treat him. And if we do the same, we're going to be just like him. That's all I got. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, these are hard sayings that we need to pray into our lives. These are Lord, situations and things that, um, Lord, do seem to, to go against the grain. But, Lord, we know that through your power, these things are going to come to pass in our lives. It's what we want. It's what we pray for. It's what you want for us. Lord, to experience the blessings and to avoid the woes. Father, we thank you for laying it out for us clearly. Lord, we pray that you would help us to walk in it. Lord, we need your power. We can't do this on our own. And so we pray again for fresh filling of your spirit. Lord, we pray for those who have not yet received you as their Savior and Lord, that today they would. This would be the day. This would be the hour. This would be the brand new life, the promise for all who believe in him, in you. And so, Lord, we we thank you for this time. We rejoice in you. Thank you that heaven awaits and is full of glory beyond what we can possibly imagine. Lord, help us to live for eternity, not for this world, not our kingdoms, O Lord, not our own well-being, but for your kingdom, for the well-being of Jesus Christ in your name. And it's in your name that we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.